Hey Wisecrack, Jared again. While you guys probably think of Key and Peele as the duo that gave us President Obama's anger translator, or the visionaries that finally made an action movie about a kitten, they're also responsible for some of the smartest comedy that's recently graced the airwaves. And while much of their success can be chalked up to their unique and often absurd characters, their true brilliance lies in their streamlined writing style, and a commitment to sketches that are as funny Negro time. What, like Atlanta? <laughs> as they are socially and emotionally true. I thought I was going to Negro town. Oh, you are. And how do they tell that truth? Well, let's find out. Since nothing is better than over explaining a joke, welcome to this wisecrack edition on Key and Peel. And I guess there's sort of spoilers ahead? To really understand what makes Key and Peel so great, we need to look a bit deeper and discover the comedic philosophy that informs their work. And believe it or not, these guys follow in the footsteps of this guy. I am the door through which you will pass. For those of you unfamiliar, that isn't the demon love child of Dan Harmon, Alan Moore, and Slavoj Zizek. That's Del Close, a pioneer of comedy who's still hugely influential today. But before we get into how Key and Peele embody Close's comedic philosophy, we need to take a look at a little comedy science. While you probably don't associate science with comedy, we can better understand the success of many Key and Peele sketches by distilling them down to a core comedic structure. In this structure, we start in a world with a built-in set of expectations, which is then contrasted with an unusual behavior, and this behavior is heightened and explored until you've pissed yourself from laughing so hard. In other words, comedy is arrived at through exploring a behavior that breaks with the expectations we have of a given situation. If we wanted to go full beautiful mind on this structure, it might look a little something like this. Reasonable reality and set of expectations, plus unusual behavior and or point of view, multiplied by raised emotional stakes, plus an ending which subverts established pattern, equals comedy bliss. But enough comedic calculus, let's take a look at Substitute Teacher as an example. The sketch opens in a high school classroom, an environment that carries with it a set of standard expectations. Bored students, chalkboards, books, and a teacher trying to wield some authority. But all this changes when Mr. Garvey begins taking attendance. Jay Quellen. Where's Jay Quellen at? No Jay Quellen here? <clears throat> yeah. Uh. Do you mean Jacqueline? Now that we have our unusual behavior, i.e. Mr. Garvey's inability to pronounce stereotypically white names, things can really get cooking. We get to see both the logic behind Mr. Garvey's frustration. I'm for real. I'm for real. Along with the increasingly terrified students. As Mr. Garvey continues this unusual behavior, his anger increases while their fear heightens. Bitch! This simple underlying logic is what helps accelerate the comedy with each move. Once we see this pattern repeated a few times, we're already predicting the next move. You done messed up, A.A. Ron! But not to be bested by an attentive audience, the sketch ends by flipping our expectations. For once, Mr. Garvey gets it right. Timothy. Present. Thank you! Let's see how this pattern plays out in some other sketches. For example, we expect a babysitter to have a quiet night, but an unusual behavior is introduced. Goo goo ga ga, I want, I want milk. And this behavior gets emotionally heightened. You're in charge of me? In my house? All right, for Forrest, it's, it's time for bed. With a last minute reveal that offers a glimpse into the comedic logic. Hush, baby Forrest Whitaker, don't say a word. Wow. Goo -goo -ga -ga. Mama's gonna buy you a mockingbird. In another sketch, we start with a fairly mundane setting until we meet our unusual companions who are intent on living their vigilante air marshal dreams. I tell you one thing, if 9-11's were to happen up on this here plane, don't worry, we got this. The stakes are then raised well above cruising altitude. You know I'm working up that plan B, brother. And rather than fizzling out by running the pattern into the ground, we get a surprise at the end that reframes what we've just seen. Of course, we know that sketches that don't follow this pattern can also be hilarious. Who can deny the pure joy of Will Ferrell's gyrating midriff? I gotta have more cowbell! Or the wondrous testicular double entendre of Alec Baldwin's baked goods. No one can resist my sweaty balls. And hell, even Key and Peel occasionally bask in the purely absurd. Some. Oh, there we go. Some. There we go. But comedic structure is only half the story. While their sketches are certainly funny, it's another element of their work that ensures that they're also smart. 
Key and Peele's commitment to finding fundamental human truth in comedy. This philosophy is not an invention of Key and Peele. However, they both cut their comedic chops in Chicago, a city whose comedy scene is permeated by this guy Del Close. And while you may not have heard of him, he's responsible for training a few decent comedians. And along the way, he helped write a book called Truth and Comedy with Sharna Halpern that's become a bible for comedians around the world. In it, they argue that the best comedy comes from mining the depths of human existence, and that this creates the grounds for comedy that is both funny and smart, an idea that we see everywhere in Key and Peele. Oh, and Del Close once claimed that a coven of witches cured him of his cocaine addiction. This has nothing to do with comedy, but I think it's worth noting. This commitment to truth isn't exclusive to Chicago comedians, as this emotionally honest style has dominated recently, from the diner, to the break room, to the streets of Italy. Now does this commitment to truth mean that good comedy always has to reflect on real and truthful situations? Hell no. But while a post-apocalyptic alien invasion might not reflect the reality of the world we live in, sorry to anyone currently on acid, the core comedic idea is still grounded in something fundamentally true that Key and Peele's characters can instantly know who is an alien by their reaction to blackness. Wait, how did you know? Come on. Redneck wants us to move into his community? Us? The friendlier the white characters are, the more certain they are of their alien nature. Would you let me date your daughter? Of course! Let's return to Mr. Garvey. What's the truth that makes this sketch so funny? For a start, this sketch reverses the trope of a well-intentioned Teach for America type out to save a bunch of inner city kids. This role reversal produces both the immediate comedy of Mr. Garvey's mispronunciations and the socially conscious fact that this is something that happens to minority students all the time. Eva Benitez. Eva. Except in that case, it's more uncomfortable than it is funny. While Mr. Garvey's reaction to a name like Denise and Aaron are hilarious, Key and Peele are forcing us to ask a more complicated question. What if black teachers were as culturally incompetent as their white counterparts? And thus we have a double-pronged comedic attack. Come for the laughter, and stay for the socially conscious criticism. The benefit of this mixture of comedic structure and finding the truth is that hilarious sketches can be found in any area of life race, religion, the dark side of professional sports, you name it. And they often do so by relating to personal experience. In their first sketch titled, I said bitch. There's a focus on the tensions found in black masculinity between being a strong alpha male and a committed partner. I looked this woman in the eye, I said, bitch, you told me 6.45. You said that. The sketch heightens the limits that two friends will go to to keep up the facade of being a hard ass. Getting further. I said, bitch. Hey guys. Hey girl, how hey, you hey, doing? Man, you, you having a good time? And further away from their spouses in the process. I said, bitch. And the interstellar lengths they'll go to to maintain this facade represent the actual effort men will put in to prove they're one of the bros. And of course, this sketch highlights the absurdity of this whole macho performance. I This theme is also explored in the expanded Key and Peele universe, as their first feature film Keanu throws two normal suburban black men into the world of organized crime and drug dealing, where they have to impersonate two legendary street assassins. At one point, we see the two main characters performing a stereotypical sort of black masculinity. Hey, let me explain something to y'all real quick. And conversely, we see some of the hardened gangsters brought to tears by the music of George Michael. You know, that's they use a similar strategy in the sketch Office Homophobe, where we see a tense interaction between two office mates. I see. So you can't handle hearing about how I'm gay. I'm sorry. You just referred to your boyfriend's penis as a baby's arm holding an apple. Well, that's what it looked like. Which leads to a serious accusation. You're homophobic. And while this sketch at first seems to set up a tired trope in which the humor is derived from a flamboyant gay stereotype. That's disgusting. Oh, I see. So you don't want to see a close-up picture of my anus because you hate gay men. This expectation is upended when the homophobe's boyfriend shows up. It's my boyfriend. How you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm doing very well. Which leads to a surprising realization for Key's character. I get it. I'm not persecuted. I'm just an ass. And the truth of this sketch? Well, no matter your sexual preference or gender identity, you can still be an asshole. A more common source of comedic inspiration has always been good old-fashioned religion, and critiques of religion are not new. When it comes to bullshit, 
big time major league bull you have to stand in awe in awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. But rather than following in the footsteps of those who find comedy in skewering religion for its irrational claims, he and Peel find a much more human take on religion, and in particular, Christianity. The sketch opens with a group of earnest believers in prayer, and this group of Christians is rewarded with a visit from the voice of God himself. I've come to answer your prayer. However, once God responds to their prayers with some practical next steps, I want you to sell everything you own and immediately begin service to the poor. They become slightly less enthused. Eventually, they find a nice loophole to avoid having to actually follow God's command of service. Oh, this house is haunted! This sketch is so great because it offers a funny critique of religion with some genuine theological nuance. The joke isn't on religion in general, or believers in particular. Rather, it points out the hypocrisy of those unwilling to take their own religious traditions seriously when it comes to following through on a not-so-fun obligation. This critique is actually one founded in Christianity itself. As the book of James famously says, faith without works is dead. Even your most devout aunt couldn't disagree with this one. An even more brutally honest social critique can be seen in their sketch, Sound Off, which is set at basic training. While we assume that the drill sergeant is going to lead the song in some absurd direction, it ends up finding comedy in a place of harsh realism. From poor families, how far we roam. From poor families, how far we roam. So the rich kids can just stay at home. The sketch doesn't only point out the disparity in who ends up fighting America's wars, but also the reality of what awaits soldiers coming home from war. We're I come home with PTSD. When I come home with PTSD, the VA hospital won't care for me. Somehow they managed to make a sketch about economic inequality and inadequate medical care in the military funny. While they have multiple sketches that use the absurdity of football for comedic fuel, Smoochie Wallace, you could call me Ty Royal, wrapping up rushes like aluminum foil. In quarterback concussion, they use the trope of the heroic quarterback to shine some light on the medical reality of the game. After taking a big hit, we see the quarterback go from confused Seriously, what, what are we doing? to quickly offering fictional baked goods All you have to do is ask, man, there's plenty of apple pie to go around you oh, want some apple pie? before getting diagnosed by a teammate. You have a brain injury. You need to get some medical attention. But after seemingly getting it together in a rousing chant of team spirit, the quarterback notices a missing piece of his identity as a rhino. Oh my god! Somebody stole our horn! And runs off. In an effective parody of the inspirational sports movie genre, Key and Peele are showing us what it would look like if these movies accurately represented the horrific injuries suffered by athletes. While that's just a few examples, Key and Peele's five seasons plus Keanu are filled with hours of insanely smart and insanely funny sketches. And because most of their work is grounded in true human emotions and situations, rather than topical humor, these sketches really hold up. But most importantly, Key and Peele serve as a reminder for the greatness of the TSA. I'm TS mother A. So if you see any Terry's trying to get froggy, you should always remember to Drax and Elm Sklounce. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace. If you guys want to hear more, we just released the first episode of the Wisecrack podcast, where we break down every episode of this season of Rick and Morty. So check the description to find out how you can find our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anything else. Also, we want to thank you guys for all the support. We love making videos for you guys and really couldn't do it without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything y'all do. Another way you can support us is by becoming a patron. You'll get immediate access to exclusive patron-only releases, including podcasts on Wonder Woman and Spider-Man, my video on Daddy Issues in Guardians of the Galaxy Part 2, and a new video on the possible meta-commentary behind Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. And we're working on more patron-exclusive content each month, including behind the scenes, experiments with new formats, quick takes, and more. So be sure to check out our Patreon page at the link in the description. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell to always be in the know on what we're up to. Thanks, y'all. Peace.